Hey, good morning. This is Richard Shu, host of Shu Untied. Uh, this morning, I'm really thrilled to have with me as my guest, Paul Llewellyn, who's the author of a best-selling book called Unshackled, Reimagining the Practice of Law. Paul, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Richard. So, Paul, let me start by asking you, uh, you obviously are a very successful lawyer. You've practiced in London. You've practiced in the United States. You've been a big law firm. You have your own firm now. Um, what would possess you and how did you have the time to write a book about the practice of law? So, yeah, so uh, certainly I, I'm busy um, in addition to law firm. I've got two young children. But this book, it had been on my mind for many, many years. Oh, interesting. And really the impetus behind this book, I absolutely love my job. I wake up, I can't get to, can't wait to get to work in the morning. Uh, oh. As you know, Richard, not every lawyer feels quite the same way about their job. <laughs> and certainly the legal profession, it's plagued with problems. And instead of just throwing up my hands and say, well, that sucks, you know, I wanted to at least start a conversation from how we train lawyers to how we service clients to how we treat each other to the legal profession as a whole and at least start a conversation mm. taking a look how can we do better both to ourselves to our clients and to the profession as a whole mm. well why don't you start by unpacking some of the core ideas of of, of some of this thinking yeah i think um as lawyers i think we're set up for failure and a lot of that is TV and movies are to blame for that. Hmm. People often come to us at one of the most stressful times in their life. They may be going through a divorce. They've been in a serious accident. They're going through a business breakup, etc. Yeah. And if you believe TV uh, or movies, everything gets resolved in one episode. It's quick. <laughs> every case goes to trial and justice is always served. <laughs> and I think often that's people's expectation of the legal system. Mm. As you know, the realities are very, very different from that. The legal system, it's its plagued by delay. Um, our courts are overworked um, and justice is very, very slow. And quote, justice is not always served. Yeah. Sometimes, for example, it may be cheaper to settle a case even though you've done absolutely nothing wrong because it's going to cost more in legal fees. Yeah. So yeah. I think because of that, there is this sort of, you know, if you're at a cocktail party and you mention lawyers, you're not going to get a warm, fuzzy response. You know, <laughs> we're right up there with politicians and car salespeople. For sure. And so I think we're almost set up for failure. Yeah. And yeah. so I wanted to, like I said, step back and look, why is that? And how can we potentially do things better? Yeah. So how, how does a practicing lawyer, how do they improve themselves? I mean, you're right. I, I talked to a lot of lawyers who don't wake up in the morning so excited to do their jobs like you do. I think it starts with law school, how we train lawyers. Mm. And I think law school does an absolutely terrible job of training lawyers. Mm. And, you know, law school, you're reading Supreme Court opinions, talking about the constitutionality of law. That's, you know, very, very few lawyers. That's their day-to-day -day life. Most of mm. my life is emails or on the phone with clients on the phones with experts how do you get clients they don't teach mm -hmm. that in law school how do you mm -hmm. service clients they don't teach that in law school so number one i think law school needs to do a much better job of preparing people for the realities of the legal profession and then once you leave law school um i talked about my experience in england you have to do a mandatory apprenticeship as a barrister as i was is called pupillage and you basically shadow a barrister for a year. You go with them to court every day. You're not just unleashed on clients right away. Compare that to here. You can pass the bar and you can open a law firm the next day. Yeah. Well, imagine if a surgeon did that. Well, I've studied surgery. You know, I've read it in the books. And then the next day you're operating on people. Yet why, why is law different? So I strongly advocate for, like the English system, some type of mandatory training. Um, I also talk in the book about civility, how we treat mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, too many people think uh, being an aggressive litigator means being aggressive. Now, to be clear, I'm very much in favor of aggressive tactics, yeah. but I'm also a strong advocate of professionalism, treating each other with respect. Again, drawing on my English experience in England, you have to refer to your opponent as my learned friend. No, and straight away that that injects some civility into the profession when you come into court you have to bow to the judge i was shocked the first time i went in a california courtroom just to hear the way some lawyers they they speak to judges 
Hmm. Um, I wouldn't dream of speaking to a, to a judge like that. Yeah. Then another thing in my book is um, how we treat clients. And I think we are a service profession. And ultimately, I think people forget that sometimes. Yeah. And every single law firm website pays lip service. We put clients first. Yeah. Every law firm says that. But what does that mean in practice? It means keeping people informed, treating them with respect. Like I said, like a service industry. You know, I talk in a book, compare great customer service companies, the Zappos, the Amazons, the Mandarin Orientals. We should be striving for the same type of client service at that. Unfortunately, as lawyers, it's a pretty low bar. Um, but that is the service culture we should be striving for. Yeah, no, those are all great ideas. Well, when did some of these ideas come to you? You said you, this is, an, these are ideas that you thought about when? Yeah, I think just, you know, I, I'm fortunate to have a pretty interesting background. As I said, I, I trained in England. I was a criminal prosecutor in England. Mm. I then came to California 23 years ago. I was at a plaintiff's firm. I was with them six years. Then I joined Big Law. I was at Latham & Watkins. And then I founded uh, my firm with Mark Lewis. We founded it 12 years ago. So I think given those, effectively, I've had four different careers. Yeah. And I think that has given me, I'm very fortunate to have a perhaps somewhat unique insight into, you know, like I said, different countries, different sides of the V, criminal law, civil law. And so I think that's sort of percolated over the years. It's given me a, a unique perspective. Yeah, you no, know, that makes sense. Well, tell me a little bit about what excites you about it so much. You personally, you said you wake up at five in the morning, you can't wait right. to start your job. What is it about it that really does make you get excited? I think no two days are ever the same. Mm. Every day is different. Mm. And I think that's what makes this job unique. Mm. You know, you're, you know, in litigation, you're learning an industry. One day you're learning about some technical aspects of computer code. The next day, um, you know, like we have a niche practice in uh, litigation arising from sexual abuse. And it's just every single day is different. And I think, and number one, and number two, to me, litigation is like a chess game. You've always got to try and be, it's the strategizing, try and be, you know, three steps ahead of your opponent. And that's what I find exciting. Interesting. Well, what about the actual advocacy part or the trial part? Those are the things lawyers frequently talk about as being very exciting. Are those oh, there's honest? no greater drama than a jury trial, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. You know, you you're putting on a production, you never know which way the jury's gonna rule. When you're when you're waiting for the jury, when the jury comes back, they've announced a verdict. You might always win, but it's always dramatic. So mm -hmm. there is no greater drama. I think if anything, it's more exciting than the TV and the movies with respect to that. <laughs> But unfortunately, very few cases go to trial, like yeah. at least in civil cases, about 1% of civil cases actually go to trial. Yeah. And part of the reason for that is justice is so expensive. Yeah. And it really, if you're an individual, you've got a lawsuit, you may have been wronged, but unless you find a lawyer willing to take it on a contingency, you know, it can literally cost hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to take a case to trial. And to the vast majority of people, that is cost prohibitive. Yeah. So really, justice is outside of their reach. And that as a society, you know, that is a failing. Yeah. You know, politicians, you know, if they build a new bridge or a new park, that's a vanity project. That's always going to get support. But if someone says we need to put more money into the justice system because it's not a shiny new object, it's not something you can see, you're unlikely to get the same level of public support. Yeah. Well, what made you decide to go into the legal profession? Was it a was it watching TV and movies? It, it was. It was a TV show. Uh, and I grew up in England uh, in the 1980s, L.A. Law. Oh, and it was um, so to me, it just glamorized the practice of law. Oh. Uh, fascinating. Um, and so I was nine years old and I announced my mother, I'm going to be a litigator in California. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm, the rest is history i'm now a litigator in california and yeah it was purely from the tv show la law that was my dream job yeah so. interesting well has writing this book spawned other ideas will there be a sequel to this book or have you has your thinking refined since you published this yeah no there's it's definitely percolating in my mind a sequel and you know i'm thinking about maybe expanding beyond the legal profession just a mm -hmm. sort of company culture how do we foster you know, a collaborative company culture. Again, there's probably thousands of books about that. Yeah. But um, but I think, again, the sort of unique perspective I hope I can bring to it from these different 
different standpoints. So it's definitely uh, some ideas are percolating for perhaps the sequel. And I'm sure you learned a lot more since you started your own firm. Had you written the book before then or is that after you? No, after. So it founded the firm 12 years ago and the book just came out last year. Okay. okay. And so, yeah, we opened 12 years ago with no clients hmm. and um, sort of it was very much a build it and hope they will come. Fortunately, we had our first client within an hour. Wow. And uh, now I think we just had our 1000th client. And we're very fortunate it's basically to represent a who's who, particularly of Silicon Valley, you know, basically some of the largest companies in the world, but also individuals as well. We have a pretty unique practice and it's about 50-50 plaintiff and defense. Hmm. And I think that makes for a better lawyer as well, because you don't just have a myopic approach to litigation. You can see what works on both sides. So that certainly makes it very, very interesting practice. So among all the other things you've done, you can now add entrepreneur to your list as well. No, first and foremost, I think of myself as a business owner as yeah. opposed to a lawyer. And I think a lot of lawyers don't appreciate that that is what we are. We are salespeople yeah. as lawyers. And I know, you know, salespeople get a bad reputation, but all we're doing is selling our time as yeah. lawyers. Yeah. And in front of a judge or a jury, we're selling an argument. So I'm certainly not shying away from being a, a salesperson. I went to a sales conference three months ago in Arizona. There were 500 people there. It consisted of car salesmen, pest control people, solar salesmen, and one lawyer. And I was the only lawyer there. <laughs> and it was it. all about closing a deal, how to close a deal. Yeah. That's all we're doing as lawyers. Yeah. And so again, I tried to take this different approach to litigation. Like I said, I'm not going to the boring legal conferences where people just pay to be speakers at, you know, <laughs> I learned far more by going to this sales conference in Arizona. I love it. I love it. What did your mother think about the fact that you fulfilled this nine-year-old announcement? Oh, she loves it. No, she came to the, <laughs> uh, the book launch party last year. I actually had two parties, one in San Francisco, one in London. She was the only person who was at both book launch parties. So, uh, <laughs> so no, she was, uh, she's very proud. So. Well, Paul, this has been a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate your taking the time. If you do decide to write a sequel to this, please come back and tell me about it. Great. Thank you for having me. And if, if anyone's interested in the book, it's available on uh, Amazon.com. And we'll include links in the, in, the, in the title, in the podcast. Great. Thanks for having me, Richard. I appreciate it. This is Richard Shu and Paul Llewellyn. Thanks.